Welcome to Geo Interesting, presented by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. For this episode, we are commemorating the anniversary of the Dayton Peace Accords. In November 1995, the Peace Accords were held in Dayton, Ohio, and officially signed in Paris on December 14th. The negotiations lasted nearly three weeks, but with the official signing of the Peace Accords came an end to a four-year-long war in the Balkans. The recording you're about to hear is of Warren Christopher, Secretary of State during the negotiations and the official signing. This audio is provided by C-SPAN. Three weeks ago, the people of the United States welcomed all of us to Dayton and urged that the three presidents seize this last best chance for peace in former Yugoslavia. Today, you will leave Dayton with a comprehensive agreement in hand. On this Thanksgiving weekend, our joint work has made it possible for the people of Bosnia to spend New Year's Day in peace for the first time in four years. The resolution and agreement on the boundaries developed while in Dayton was reached in part by the use of cartography and maps provided by NGA's legacy organization, the Defense Mapping Agency, which will be referred to in this podcast as DMA. For this podcast, we interviewed NGA historian Dr. Gary Ware, who gave us a historic perspective of the accord, and following him, we interviewed NGA employee David Doctory, who shared his personal account of creating maps at Dayton during the negotiations. Stay tuned for Geo Interesting. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ware, for being here. Um, so my first question is, if you could briefly explain what the Dayton Peace Accords were. All right. It was an effort on the part of President Bill Clinton to resolve the problems that were taking place in the Balkans. Back in 1980, uh, Tito, the dictator of Yugoslavia, died. And the subsequent decade saw that country beginning to come apart according to ethnic preferences. Violence broke out in 1991, and it became a rather nasty situation for quite a few years. And in 1995, uh, Clinton asked the the warring parties, after they were subdued to a certain degree by our intervention, to come to the table in Dayton, Ohio, to iron out the difficulties and to bring peace to the region. So where did maps fit in? You can't make an accord unless you know what you're discussing, okay? So we provided maps to allow everybody to understand completely what the region looked like, what they were surrendering, what they were gaining, uh, right down to the fine points of, you know, avoiding placing a village between two boundary points. So you have to know what you're looking at. You have to know the terrain. You have to know all the routes and the, and the rivers and streams and all the rest. Who's going to get what? Right, and how practical is this once you divvy everything up? Does it make sense to have it done that way? So maps tell you what the region looks like, gives you content. So according to previous reporting, estimates of more than 30,000 maps were distributed during these uh, negotiations. Um, why is that you know, so important? Why is that such a large number? Well, it's first of all, you have so many people involved, right? You have at least a half dozen ethnic leadership groups as well as our own people, who have to be informed. You have a fairly large region of Europe, and they're going quite literally area by area, block by block, because there's so much tension involved. There's so many different ethnic groups in a very, very small, concentrated area. So the maps were there to make sure everybody knew exactly what they were dealing with. Also, the maps become ground truth. As they are, you know, you pick up a map at a gas station, you want to go from point A to point B, you trust it. Right. DMA was a trusted broker. In other words, we bring the information to the table that everybody can agree on to the extent that, yes, this is our region. All right, where do we go from here? So not to reiterate anything you previously said, but I think some of our younger listeners, um, those who like myself, um, have always had Google Maps or a GPS application to see boundary lines in real time. Mm -hmm. So in the context, why is it, was it important at Dayton to see these boundary lines like in real time? Why? Right. Two reasons, I think. One more important than, than the next. The most important was to keep the discussions on track. 
If somebody's willing to give a little or to take a little or to compromise constructively, you want to be able to immediately inform them regarding what they're giving up and what they're receiving. Right, so the maps are there and they're there swiftly, almost in real time. Also for DMA, it was an exercise based on a reinvention they had just gone through, not, not barely a few months earlier, knocking down all of their vertical stovepipes and increasing the horizontal integration to the point where they could respond this quickly if asked to. Previously, it would have been quite a, quite a task for them to do that. Now it was not. So there was an element of like cutting edge technology that allowed for more hands-on visualization. Um, so again, uh, this was essentially a huge moment of importance that this was revolutionary, like the technology being used. So could you kind of explain what some of those technology advances were that may have not been used previously? Sure, if we take a look at the date, we're talking 1995, okay? As just five years earlier, Right, DMA had gone through a second step in an effort to enable their analysts and their cartographers to use photography in a digital manner to convert it into maps and charts. This is brand new. So here they got to try it out on site. Okay, and so it's, uh, it's not that people haven't used photographs and maps before. It's just that being able to bring them in using government systems and to manipulate them properly to have them say and do what you want them to do, and then to insert them into a map situation. It was something that was very, very new and very, very uh, exciting for many of them. The other part of it is sort of a, a Star Wars effect because they were also providing the negotiators with fly-throughs that allowed them to literally simulate an aircraft going through the region that they were negotiating. Right, so they could remind themselves what was there, where the villages were, what the topography looked like, where the rivers went, where the irrigation was done, all the rest. But we were doing, when well, we had pictures of this in the NGA archives, for example, they were using the same silicon graphics computers that George Lucas used on Star Wars. And this is 1995. Very cool. Um, so what has changed since then? How might maps play a role in negotiations and scale today? They always play a role now. Oh, we can produce them even faster now than we could before. It's also the wise negotiator that has maps on site. Initially, to make sure everybody's equally informed, to make sure everybody trusts the sources they're working with. What's ground truth here, as we mentioned before? Mm -hmm. Or we can provide ground truth, okay? That's the departure point of a negotiation. Right, once they move into exchanging and being flexible and negotiating various and sundry important points, we can almost instantly show them what the world, how the world changes on the ground according to the way they're talking, right? I don't think any negotiation from Dayton on would want to proceed without maps done in that fashion. And we set the standard for that sort of thing. Well, thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Awesome. Officials at Dayton said flexibility was crucial during the negotiations, and the mapping support kept pace with the numerous changes. Throughout the effort, mappers were on call to the customer, and DMA support personnel at full strength averaged 16 to 18 hour shifts per day, seven days a week. Stay tuned to hear the first-hand account of David Daughtry, a cartographer at the Dayton Peace Accords. Without further ado, I um, want to thank you for being here. Um, but the first question is, uh, what was your position during the Dayton Peace Accords? So I, at the time, I was assigned to the Defense Mapping Agency, the Defense Mapping School. I was an Army Captain Engineer. I had just returned from two years of graduate school at The Ohio State University with a degree in geographic information systems and analytic cartography. For the Dayton Peace Accords, we were literally deployed uh, from here at Fort Belvoir to Dayton. Um, my role was to serve uh, on a very large team to deliver mapping services for the Peace Accords. And I had some specific experiences while I was there in that role. 
So how were you chosen for that? Um, well, <laughs> so the the call basically came into the schoolhouse looking for uh, f- folks who had expertise using Arc Info was the software tool of the day, um, and people who had an understanding of geographic information systems and map making. The, the team that was out there was doing cartographic type production, and they needed somebody to help with some digital stuff. Uh, at the schoolhouse, we had just begun a program, and we also had equipment there. So we had uh, the tools of the day, which was a, uh, a big computer system and big green boxes and a plotter and a big green box and some other tools. So that's why we were picked. We were basically the only guys they knew of that could do this stuff. Okay, awesome. Um, so how was geography a critical element of the Peace Accord? So what were some like key geographic like issues or disputes? Sure. So it was really all about terrain and turf. Who had what? Um, and so, you know, following the, the conflict there, there was, of course, a lot of dispute over territory when they finally did get brought to the table to discuss peace. They had been fighting. A lot of it was eth- uh, because of ethnicity, mm-hmm. background. You know, if you, you go and read the history books, it's been happening there a real long time. So it was about terrain. The border of Bosnia-Herzegovina with the rest of uh, the region there was pretty well defined. Um, what we were doing in the peace accords was defining um, where the separation uh, between the two warring factions would be. They called it the zone of separation or the ZAS. Um, so could you explain a typical day there? Um, well, so we were there for just about two weeks. Um, there was no typical day. Um, the initial part of uh the assessment was we, we were operating on a one to 600,000 scale map. So so think almost of a, a tourist map. And they were literally using a pen uh, marker to draw this line on this map of where they thought this zone of separation should be. And then they would ask us to determine how much territory that represented for each side. Uh, And then they wanted to see that map. Um, At the same time, we were trying to uh, take that geographic information and get it down to larger scale maps. So the one in the 50,000 scale map, which is your typical military map, so folks could really see where this line was. Mm -hmm. And so they would send that map over from the negotiating table. It would make its way across the compound. Uh, come down into our base of operation. We were in the post theater at the time. And then we would have to take that map. We would have to digitize it and transfer that information into our GIS to then plot it back out on that map, pack it back up, and send it across the compound to the other side. And so there's, and that those negotiations and that line drawing happened at all hours. So it was a 24-hour operation. Um, The same time, those two warring factions had their map makers in country, so they were checking us out. So we would have to print that stuff out, take it over to where they were staying so they could go through it and see what we were doing. And that was really important because it helped them to realize that we weren't doing anything uh, out of the ordinary, Mm -hmm. that we were uh, doing cartographic a production just like they would with their stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, after uh, uh, several days of that, they got very frustrated with the time it was taking. Really? Yeah, because, you know, they would draw the line on the map, and then it would have to get walked across the compound, come downstairs, we digitize it, we had to do all that work. You know, it would take a couple hours before they would see the results. Yeah. And they were like, hey, how come we can't see it right away? So we had the brilliant idea. We said, we'll take a digitizing tablet and one of our workstations and we'll bring it up there yeah so they were doing this level of negotiations in a officer's uh, single quarters boqs on base 
and they had a, a bank of computers in there. They did have some um, imagery that they were able to, to look at. I set up in the far corner with my digitizing tablet in my, my system, and those guys would come in with their map, and I would take it. I'd throw it on the table. I'd be able to digitize a line within 12 minutes. could tell them how much territory yeah. each side had. So we were able to get them to agree to look at it on the computer. Okay. Um, and at the time, we had a, a software tool called PowerScene, which allowed uh, 3D flyovers of mm -hmm. the terrain. And we were able to put that line in there. And so they could watch as we flew along the line. And they could make adjustments. They could say, oh, no, the line's in the wrong place. Uh, that side of the river should be mine, and that side's his. And we could go in and move the line right there. Wow until we got it pretty well agreed upon. So That's it was an iteration. And then finally, when they agreed on all that, then we could print it out on the 1 to 50,000 maps, which they then used to actually conclude the uh, piece of cords there. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That was very, so like it went from you know taking a couple hours to get a map done to right there, them watching you do it. In fact, I call this experience the, the birth of Geoint because this is where we brought imagery yeah. and mapping together to, to deliver services. Um, it was unusual in that we were, quote, deployed. We were doing 24-hour operations. For a military officer, that's what we do. So that wasn't unique. Um, so I don't think that was anything different. Certainly s similar to what we do today. Mm -hmm. What are some of the differences from the maps you created then compared to what you do now at NGA? Um, so the, the accuracy of those maps, um, was, was probably different than what it is today. Um, today we're much more precise. Um, we did not have global positioning system data back then. So we were relying on surveyed topographic data that was on a map. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's a, a, a big difference. Um, I think some of the other things uh, that we do today with uh, the way we combine all of the different data sources also is a, is a huge difference. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. Bye. In a moment, the three presidents will initial the agreement. They've come a long ways in the last 20 days, and their initialing here today will signal their determination to stay on the path of peace. Again, that audio was provided by C-SPAN. It's like they say, the rest is history. The peace accord was signed, DMA succeeded in providing support to world leaders, and a year later was consolidated into the National Imagery and Mapping Agency or NEMA. Imagery and mapping solidified at Dayton was the backbone of what NGA does today. GeoInteresting is presented by NGA's Office of Corporate Communications. To hear more episodes, check us out on SoundCloud and iTunes. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and at www.nga.mil. Thanks for listening. Thank you.